osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, Chad was a, is a native of Arkansas. He received his uh, bachelor's degree at Washington University, his medical degree at University of Arkansas. He was an intern resident at Boston City Hospital and a fellow in rheumatology at Boston University. Uh, he was assistant professor at Boston University, went over to Case Western Reserve where he was associate professor. He received teacher of the year at the Cleveland Clinic and he's been on the auditorial board of the Journal of Clinical Densitometry, and he's going to speak this morning about fracs and the uh, use of it in fracture risk assessment. As I was listening to Ego, I can, you know, Ego is one of the most passionate, as you can tell, people about what he uh, teaches. Uh, if any of you haven't read Progress in Osteoporosis and uh, Bone Key, they're some of the most uh, insightful reviews of the literature and probably the most comprehensive of any medical topic I've ever read. So, so when, when Ego's in the audience, you always scan, you, you want to scan an audience to see if Ego's there because he's always the one that comes to the, uh, the microphone and really challenges you. So I'm sure that, that, that may happen uh, now. And one, one other thing, when I, when I was listening to Ego talk about Dennis Black's article in the New England Journal and say how annoyed he was, I just, what, you don't want to make Ego annoyed, right Ego? <laughs> so hopefully the flax talk won't make Ego too annoyed. So. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mike McClung for giving me some slides. So where you see Oregon Osteoporosis Center in the bottom left, those are Mike's, Mike's slides. Uh, so how many people use fracs here? Okay, so how many don't use? How many are annoyed by fracs? Okay, so we have some annoying. So when when I give a FRAX talk, um, you, you never can tell you can run into a buzzsaw because there's always a lot, a lot of people who have opinions, obviously, and, that, and that's very appropriate because ultimately I think you can see FRAX is really a platform that helps, I think, make reasonable clinical judgments concerning cost-effective therapy. And I think whatever you say about FRAX, what we were doing before FRAX, as I'll talk in, in a minute, uh, was clearly inferior to what we're doing with FRAX. But ultimately, FRAX is a tool, and like all tools, it has to be used skillfully to achieve results. And really, FRAX was made for primary care physicians, not people who are experts in osteoporosis. It's, it's really to inform and help primary care physicians make more rational decisions, which they weren't doing and are still not doing. And so FRAX shouldn't be used in the clinic without appreciations of its limitations as well as its strength. And there are many limitations to FRAX, and there are many uh, assumptions in FRAX, and some of which we'll talk about, that uh, you should know about when you go to the website. Um, and the use of FRAX with the generation of a number really doesn't ever replace clinical judgment. And uh, as, as we've talked about, they're always in the audience uh, FRAX enthusiasts and detractors, and few remain neutral. So if any, any folks want to get their mojo up and come after me, uh, if the light stays on for more than four hours, call your electrician. I don't have a comparable, comparable one for women. So this is, this is what we were doing in the United States uh, before FRAX. We were relying on the 2003 NOF guidelines. Now we have the 2008 NOF guidelines. And the 2003 guidelines um, did not include men. So you can see we have women only. Now we have men and women in the 2008. Both had treatment with a prior history of hip or vertebral fracture. But the old guidelines recommended treating everybody at a T-score of minus 2, which was clearly over treatment. Now we have a recommendation to treat everybody at a T-score of minus 2.5. And you can argue about that also. We also had a recommendation realizing, as, as you've heard from Ego, that, that we shouldn't be basing our treatments on T-scores. We should be basing it on risk or absolute risk. That there were patients who had risk factors, at least that was realized, or mentioned in the 2003 NOF guidelines. And they said treat everybody at a T-score of minus one, one and a half if they had a risk factor. And there were only four risk factors, family history, previous fracture, low body weight, and current smoking. 
And now we recommend if somebody has, quote, osteopenia or a T-score between minus 1 and minus 2.5 to apply the FRAX model. And if the 10-year absolute risk of a hip fracture is greater than 3% or of major osteoporotic fracture is greater than 20%, then treat. So the old guidelines led to something like this. If you look at a 55-year-old woman who had a T-score of minus 1.5 and, and was a smoker, therefore met the old 2003 NOF guidelines for treatment, you look at her 10-year absolute fracture risk based on FRAX, and let's just take the hip, the 10-year absolute risk of hip fracture is, is small or, or not, almost non-existent, 0.9%. And if you look at the number needed to treat by 100 uh, divided by the absolute risk reduction, and you assume that you can get a 50% reduction with the medication, assuming you take it, um, then the number needed to treat to prevent a hip fracture in this particular patient is 222 for 10 years at a cost of $800 per year. So it costs a million seven hundred thousand dollars to prevent a hip fracture. Plus you, of course, would be exposing this patient to the potential risks of long-term bisphosphonate therapy. So that's clearly inadequate. It's not cost-effective. It's not selecting patients at high risk for fracture. And we clearly certainly needed to do better. So this is a, an article from Beth Dawson Hughes looking at a comparison between the 2003 and the 2008 NOF guidelines in terms of who gets recommended for treatment. And the light bars you can see are the old 2003 NOF guidelines, and the darker hatch bars are the new 2008 NOF guidelines. And you can see, especially in the 50 to 59-year-old age group, we've dramatically reduced our treatment recommendations based on the 2008 guidelines from 42 to 6%. And what we've really done is transfer treatment from younger patients who are at lower risk to older patients who are at higher risk. Of course, the problem with making recommendations like this is we have, as Ego said yesterday, we have very few studies in patients with osteopenia, the CFR drugs reduce fracture, and we have very few studies in, or no studies in patients who are 80 and up in terms of fracture reduction. You know, so models that incorporate falls like the Garvin model from Australia or others, might be very important, but of course falls aren't amenable to pharmacologic intervention, most likely, at least not with bisphosphonates, possibly with estrogens. Um, so uh, the total numbers treated by the new guidelines are fewer, and that causes some consternation, I think, because we all were in this mindset of prevention, prevention, prevention. So, Osteoporosis, as you've heard, is a disorder that causes, uh, that increases fracture risk. Fracture prevention is really the goal of osteoporosis therapy, and treatment has been documented to be effective in patients who are at moderate to high risk, but in most cases, therapy is not cost effective and not appropriate in patients at low risk, and really treatment should be based on fracture risk, but there's really no consensus on how to best select those at risk for fracture, or there wasn't. So as you've heard already, the operational definition, which Ego was a part of back in Rome in whatever year that was, it was before I was born. <laughs> so um, over a lot of wine was a T-score of less than minus two and a half. So for the prediction of fracture, again, as you've already heard, uh, this is not very sensitive. And that's because most fractures occur in a population, occur in patients who, who don't have osteoporosis. They have osteopenia. So the challenge is to select patients who have low bone mass who are at high risk, not low risk for fracture. And that's what we have a hard time doing and had a hard time doing and still have a hard time doing. So this is illustrated by many studies. Uh, this is from the study of osteoporotic fractures, illustrating that in a population, only 46% of hip fractures occurred in patients with a T-score less than minus 2.5. And that's actually a high number. As you've heard again from, from EGO, it, it can be as low as 25% sensitivity or detection rate uh, in some populations. So you clearly have to have a strategy if you're going to reduce the total burden of, of fracture that addresses 
the patients who are have low bone